Hey everybody, welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. Today is September 26th, right, September 26th, 2014, and this is episode 16. Our theme for today is Yarn Memory, which as you will see, loosely ties together the threads of discussion for today. And now I will officially stop punning. <laughs> I don't even mean to start doing it. It just starts coming out, you know? The yarn puns, they're irresistible. All right, so I have, it's been three weeks since my last confession. So I have a lot to talk to you about. Uh, sorry for not being here last week, but I was at Arkansas Fiber Arts Extravaganza teaching a lot. And uh, so I have a lot to tell you about that event, which was wonderful. And I was just, I was planning to, to podcast when I came back. Uh, I was, my first full day back was Monday. I was just exhausted, as you will soon understand why. So I just decided, all right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait until the end of this week when, when I would normally podcast and just kind of reset the whole schedule. So here I am. So a few little announcements before we get started are kind of smaller bits that, uh, that I want to go ahead and talk about. Um, one thing is that I, um, well, actually, I guess it's, it's just one, one announcement, really. But I, uh, I wanted to thank the people who have, um, have posted and, and reviewed and uh, podcasted and blogged about my Kung Fu Knits book. There's been some really great stuff coming out. Some of it I set up and some of it was set up by the press. And, uh, and it's been so much fun for me to, to read and watch and listen to these uh, comments on the book. And I have to say that two of my favorites so far are both on podcasts. One is an audio podcast, the Downseller Studio Podcast with Boston Jen. And the other is the Fibertown Podcast with Emily. And um, in both cases, they reviewed the book with a kid sitting there in the room with them. So Boston Jen uh, had her nieces and nephew with her. And <laughs> it is seriously the cutest thing. She reviews the book herself first and then has audio of the three kids with her. She's clearly just read them the book. And they're commenting on it. And I think it's the nephew in particular. He sounds like he's about four or five. Just goes bananas. <laughs> he's um, saying, I want you, I want you to knit me the sweater and the pants, and I want all the things that boy is wearing, and I'm going to put my Ninja Turtles in the bag. <laughs> it is so cute. And then, uh, Oliver, who is Emily on Fibertown's son, who is seven, I believe, and has just learned how to knit, reviewed the book with her and uh, equally adorable, if more sophisticated. <laughs> They're really wonderful. So I will link those reviews in the show notes. Uh, the podcasts that they feature on are wonderful podcasts to listen to and watch anyway. So uh, if you haven't started listening to or watching them, you can thank me later. Uh, there have also been uh, Vanessa Laven of the Mixed Martial Arts blog. You can see why I sent it to her. Uh, she also has very kindly reviewed the book. And uh, there's an interview with me on the Barocco Yarns website that kind of focuses on the book because all of the, all of the samples I knit were knit in uh, Barocco Vintage. So yeah, very exciting. It's, it's been really fun to, after all of this time working on these projects and working on the designs and the photography and the layout, and I really did a lot of this book myself. It's, uh, it's really exciting to get to see people's feedback. I am, there are a couple of events coming up, which you may or may not be able to participate in. Uh, one of them, of course, is here in Austin. I'm going to be signing, if you're anywhere in the Austin area and planning to come to the Yarn Crawl on the first Saturday of the Yarn Crawl in mid-October, I will be signing books at uh, the Knitting Nest, which uh, is on South Congress and, uh, and is in Austin. And that event will be taking place from 1 to 4 p.m. And I believe 
this isn't entirely set up yet, but I believe there will be a uh, self-defense demonstration uh, by one of the teachers or the advanced students from my son's Kung Fu school. One of the women is going to come and do a, a demonstration of some self-defense techniques for people who come to the book signing. I hope. <laughs> They're still trying to find a volunteer to do it. I may have to actually karate chop somebody into doing it. <laughs> Uh, so that's coming up, and then uh, the following weekend, I will be at Rhinebeck, and will be sort of informally signing books at the Cooperative Press booth. There isn't a time set up for when I'm going to be signing books, but you are welcome to come by any time on Saturday. I'll be working there all day on Saturday, and uh, we'll have copies of the book, and I will be happy to sign it for you and give you a hug. <laughs> So, and, you know, hopefully some more events to follow, but that's what's on the immediate horizon. Okay, so that's, that's sort of announcement-y type stuff. I have a few things to talk about today that are kind of tied into the, to the theme of yarn memory. So, kind of the idea behind yarn memory is uh, that yarn, and especially wool, has a memory for the shape that it uh, originally occupied. So if you, uh, and you've probably experienced this, especially from what rewashing a superwash wool garment or a cotton garment, especially, it will, even if it's, you know, kind of stretched out, it will snap back into shape when you wash it. And this happens with regular wool as well. So uh, I was kind of playing with that, that loose, with that idea to kind of connect together some of the things I want to talk about. So uh, basically uh, the, the segments, I guess, that I'm going to, to do are, and I'm not quite sure which order I'm going to do them in yet, but I have a yarn review of Silver Spun, which is a, a lovely yarn that is produced. Uh, it's under the La Lana Mundi Yarns Company, but it's uh, pr distributed by the Feel Good Yarn Company. So I'll talk about that in a moment. You've probably seen this around. It's a really interesting yarn. Um, I have a review of that. I am going to talk about an incredible yarn windfall that landed in my lap. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably already know about this, but I want to show you <laughs> what happened. And, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the yarn itself and why I think it's interesting. I, have, uh, I want to talk about Arkansas Fiber Arts Extravaganza. So that's probably the the loosest use of yarn memory because it's just, I have nice memories. And I even brought some yarn that are memories back from the, and some fiber back from the trip. And then uh, I have a technique segment for you at the end where I will talk about how to, at least one way, to get yarn back into its former condition after you've already knit with it once. Like if you frog something and it's all kinked up, how do you how do you get it back into a nice pristine shape so that you can knit it again or crochet it either way? So there's a lot to talk about. This show is going to run a little long. Hey, remember, remember at the beginning of the podcast episode one where I said I was only going to do twenty minute episodes? <gasps> oh, good times. All right, so I think I will start with a review actually. Uh, I was sent a, as I just talked about on my previous episode, I have uh, started a relationship with a company called Stitchcraft Marketing, which kind of helps other yarn and fiber related companies to market and publicize their products. So they kind of act as a go-between for companies that, you know, kind of need to outsource that work. So uh, they, one of the things that they do is they send out yarns and other products for review to podcasters and bloggers. So this is another yarn that they sent me, uh, like Mountain Colors, last week. Ooh, I'm going to need to pause this and draw for the Mountain Colors winner. <laughs> totally forgot to do that. All right, make it a note that I will add that at the end. Always thinking. Memory like a cheese grater. Okay, anyways, back to Silver Spun. This is the tag for the yarn. Let me see if I can get that to focus a little better. Maybe if I hold it back a little bit. 
I'll read it to you too. Uh, the yarn is called Silver Spun. The content is 87% combed cotton, and I can't read this backwards, 11% silver, 2% lycra, and it is 173 yards per 50 gram skein. So it comes in a typical skein put up, but I've already knit with it. So it, and this, this actually, it's not quite this shiny. The light is just reflecting off the silver, I think. But there's, there actually is 11% silver, as in the metal, in this yarn. It doesn't feel at all metallic. It's actually quite soft in the way that, uh, you know, really nice cotton yarns are. It is very stretchy. I know that's not, doesn't seem very stretchy, but it's one of those, if you ever knit with Cascade Fixation before it was discontinued, you will know exactly the kind of yarn I'm talking about. Uh, another yarn I've knit with that is like this is Elan Esprit. Uh, there are a lot of these yarns that are cotton mixed with lycra. They are super stretchy. Uh, so much so that you really have to use a much larger needle size than you might think you would need to. This is listed as a sport weight on Ravelry. It looks more like a DK weight, and in fact that's the gauge that I get when I knit a fabric that I like, a stockinette fabric. Uh, However, I knit it on a size 6, which for me is quite large for knitting a DK weight gauge. Normally I would knit, if I'm going to get five and a half stitches per inch, I would normally knit that on a 4 or a 3, since I'm a pretty loose knitter. So, and the reason why that happens is because this is so stretchy that it kind of stretches over the needle, and then once it's off the needle, it sproings back into its regular position again and kind of collapses. So uh, yeah, you have to knit it on a bigger needle. It is, um, why the silver is in it is an interesting question. And I'd be interested to know more from the company about the history of this yarn. I'm gonna see if I can follow up on that and find out more about why they decided to develop this. Uh, there seems to be a really interesting story here because they mention on their sheet that uh, it was developed, that the cotton is grown in North Carolina and the yarn is spun at North Carolina State's Spin Lab. And I looked that up, I've got it linked in the show notes. Uh, they, there's a textile lab at NC State where they do, they develop, they help develop products basically. They'll uh, work with you to develop new kinds of yarn and fiber. And uh, they seemed particularly interested in using uh, fibers that aren't normally put into yarn, like silver. So that's a, that's really interesting, and I'm curious as to why why this yarn company decided to pursue this. If it was kind of the lab was doing it, and they were looking for a way to to sell it on the market and see what people thought, or if it was the other way around, if the yarn company you know kind of came to them and said, "Could we do this?" I suspect that one of the reasons that this got started was because uh, th there's a lot in the in the, the sheet that they send out about this yarn and in the publicity about it. Uh, they talk about the therapeutic benefits of silver. And um, so for instance, they say that silver adds thermal, conductive, and therapeutic properties to the yarn that it inhibits the growth of bacteria, including those that cause odor. Um, so silver spun is a good choice for socks, which I agree, this would be a good sock yarn. That it's good for baby clothing and toys because of the antibacterial properties. Uh, yeah, so basically that it has kind of therapeutic and antibacterial, antimicrobial properties. Okay, I have a skeptic's brain. And I, uh, I had to look this up. <laughs> wasn't quite sure I believed that claim. And in fact, I don't take my word for it because I'm sure that there are people who have done much more thorough research than I have on this. But in what I was able to find uh, on reliable sites, the antimicrobial claims about silver are certainly true. In fact, I thought this was really interesting. I've got an article link to the show notes from a uh, surgical journal where they talk about how silver was actually one of the most reliable antibacterial agents before the development of antibiotics. 
So that's very interesting. So in fact, that does seem to be a legitimate claim. Uh, the therapeutic benefits of silver, um, you know, whether the topical application of it does anything other than prevent the spread of bacteria, that seems to be more debatable. Um, and to put this in context, I am someone who is, uh, I'm not somebody who immediately dismisses homeopathic claims, uh, but I wasn't really able to find particularly good evidence that that's true. So um, I, I say all this not to, not to try to, um, I'm not complaining about the, the, the yarn companies claim that this might have therapeutic properties. They can certainly do that if they want, but it's just, you know, go into this with some skepticism. And I think what I, what I want to say about this is that if you're going to get this yarn, get it because it's a really cool yarn, not because you think it's going to heal you. <laughs> uh, and it is a really cool yarn. And I want to focus more on that aspect of it. It is a challenging yarn, actually, in the sense that it is it's a very, if you've not worked with cotton and lycra before, it can be a little tricky to figure out what to do with it. So I, um, I really like to do more than just make a swatch with these yarns that I'm reviewing. We'll see if I can sustain that kind of <laughs> commitment. But um, I started out thinking, oh, I'm going to make fingerless, I'm going to make gloves with this. Because uh, actually one of the other cool things about silver is it's conductive, right? So you can it, you can make gloves with it, and in fact, there's a pattern that you can. Um, I think that Mari Luke did that, uh, or maybe it's the owner of Feel Good Yarn Company. But somebody did a pattern for basically texting gloves. So they're mittens that are joined around all these fingers, and then this one has its own finger. The thumb and the finger are basically separate, so that you can wear these gloves and still, you know, do stuff on a tablet or a smartphone. So that actually does work. I, I tested that out. I made some gloves, tested it out, and it does work. It's sometimes a little bit, my phone was a little bit less responsive when I had these gloves on, but I was still able to get it to work. So that's pretty cool. So I made these gloves. Well, I made a glove because I had enough for a glove and I had enough time for a glove. <laughs> And I really, really like how it looks in stockinette and reverse stockinette. I did reverse stockinette here just, well, partly just for the variety and also because cables look pop nicely off of reverse stockinette. Uh, it looks really great. This is just a standard three by three cable. Looks good in ribbing. It's not, well, it is, it is quite stretchy. Um, and I think it, it really, it, it, it's best suited to stockinette fabric and cables. I tried, I started doing the glove and just thought, I got, you know, I got about this far and I thought, oh, maybe I should try something a little more. I mean, it's got silver in it. Maybe I should try something a little fancier. So I tried doing a lace cowl. And, uh, and what I you would think I would watch my own episodes and listen to my own advice. Remember I was talking about about uh, stretchy yarns and, and plump plies and what they're good for, and remember when I said that they're not particularly well suited to lace? <laughs> okay, so not only is this, I, I believe this is chain plied. It's a little hard to tell by looking at it, but it has a, seems to have a chain ply structure. Uh, and on top of that, it's stretchy, right? So it just collapses. Uh, so those yarn overs were just kind of disappearing. Now, maybe if I had, if I'd had enough time and had wanted to start over yet again, maybe if I had done, done this on like a size nine or 10 needle, I might've been able to get a lace fabric that was, that was interesting. But you know, you're just not going to be able to get it to block right because that lycra is always going to make it snap back. So I'm not sure it's particularly well suited to lace, but stockinette and, uh, and ribbing and cables, gorgeous. Um, it is super stretchy. Watch what happens when I, I mean, I have a pretty big hand. I've got, I could be on the cover of bossy pants. <laughs> I got big hands. 
So when I take this off, look at this. These tiny, tiny little fingers. These fingers, this one is 14 stitches around. At five and a half stitches per inch, that is when it's unstretched, that is what? It's about three inches, which I guess that's big, but I don't know. When I when I put this on, it feels like it's, you know, I sort of, I, I have to kind of wrench it on because like I have to do this with the fingers to get it on because it's so stretchy, it just wants to kind of stay where it is. Um, so yeah, very, very stretchy, very soft. This feels great. The one thing that I, that gave me some hesitation about this was I was thinking, how useful is a cotton glove, especially an undyed, very light colored cotton glove. So this is going to get dirty super fast. It's not that warm, although the silver, I don't know, maybe the silver is making it warm. It's 85 degrees here today. I think it's keep, it's making my hand warm because it's already pretty warm here. It's not glove wearing weather. I'd be curious to see how this holds up in terms of, you know, does it make a really warm glove? Um, and then I'm thinking, okay, so if it's not, if you're not going to use it for gloves, what do you want to use it for? Because, um, you know, you kind of want to maximize the fact that the silver is in there and the stretchiness. Uh, I suppose, I think socks are a good choice, although that doesn't really, that doesn't really maximize the silver's benefit. So I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny yarn in that sense that it's a little difficult to figure out exactly what to do with it. I think it would make a great hat. I th so I guess really what I'm saying is that I think it's softness and it's stretchiness make it a great candidate for certain kinds of projects where you want that. It would make a great toy, it would make a great hat, gloves, mitts, anything that you where you want it to fit snugly. Um, I don't, it's harder to imagine applications for, that make, that take best advantage of the silver. But, all of that said, I think it's a really, really interesting yarn, and I really, I applaud people who want to stretch the boundaries of what's possible with yarn and fiber. It's so exciting to see yarns come out that have milk fiber in them and bamboo. I mean, bamboo is not, it, I remember when bamboo yarn started first coming out. It wasn't that long ago, or at least first coming out in the States. Uh, so this, you know, it's exciting to see Habu and some of these other companies really experimenting with what's possible with putting paper and, uh, what's that Habu one? It's stainless steel. I mean, there's just fascinating stuff going on with fiber. So I know I have, uh, said some semi-critical things about some of the claims and some of the, you know, how you would use this, but, uh, I think this is a really, really interesting yarn and something well worth knitting with simply because it is, um, it's a very nicely constructed yarn and, uh, and it has some really interesting, interesting uses and benefits. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about this for now. I think that is it. You are supposed to hand wash this, it says, although I wonder if you could, probably shouldn't machine wash this now that I think about it because of the metallic content. And interestingly, the sheet says that uh, you need to use your finished item regularly to keep it from tarnishing, which I just thought was fascinating. You know, it's just like any silver spoon or teapot or anything like that. Teapot. Why would you have a silver teapot? You know what I mean? Uh, that you've got to, you have to polish it basically. You know how if you use silver spoons, all the time, they won't tarnish just be because they're constantly being used. I guess same goes for same goes for this yarn, which is totally fascinating. Okay, so that is my review of Silver Spun from Lana Mundi Yarns. Thank you so much for sharing with sharing it with me. It's really fun to get to test this stuff out. Oh, and I forgot to mention uh, this is my own 
creation. I, I just, I just wanted to knit. And, um, you know, I, I actually had never knit a glove before. So I thought, I'm just going to try knitting a glove and see how that goes. I had done, uh, I have a pattern called Frankenfingers that is, um, that is a, it's a fingerless glove, but it actually has little fingers on it. So I had tried doing some of that before, but I had never done fingers all the way to the top. And I would say, um, especially if you have been knitting for a while and you've done a couple of fingerless mitts, just go ahead and, and do, you know, kind of a standard fingerless mitt pattern and then just knit some fingers on it's, it's fiddly, but it's not hard. Um, you do have to kind of sew up these little, these little gaps in here. Uh, no matter how much picking up of stitches I did around there and so on, it just ended up needing to be sewn up. But um, there's nothing particularly complicated about it. And if you just keep trying them on, you know, you can figure out how long each finger is supposed to be. And my tech editor gave me a great tip about uh, the pinky. If you look at your, your pinky is actually a little bit lower. It starts a little bit lower than the rest of your fingers. So she said, you know, do the pinky first and you know these stitches held off a little bit and then work a few more rounds just with these like around all three of these fingers and then do these fingers individually so there's like a little bit of knitting right here before these fingers start and it actually does fit a little bit better I thought that was an interesting tip I don't know if I, I might write it up I don't know we shall see if you're interested let me know all right, I'm going to pause this right now before I forget to do the mountain colors drawing and I will come back and announce who won that yarn from last week. Hang on. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to tell you I got new glasses. Aren't they cool? Sorry if they reflect too much, but I got them at this shop in uh, here in Austin called Eclectic Eyewear. Check it out. Love them so much. I hadn't gotten my eyes tested in it may have been like seven years or something like that. Turns out my prescription actually hadn't changed, so that was something of a relief. But I had actually lost all of my glasses, like going back several prescriptions, so it was time. Anyways, so uh, mountain colors. Here's the skein that was up for up for giveaway. I had the, the review on last week's ep or last episode. And uh, the winner is Sheila O'Keefe, who was uh, entry number 91 on the uh, Dark Matter Knits group Ravelry thread, where we had the giveaway. And, uh, and she said, let me find her, her post. She says, um, I don't have any men to knit for, but I'm a sucker for a man in a gorgeous cabled sweater. I'd asked for people to share their uh, their favorite men's patterns. Oh heck, I'm a sucker for cables, period. Martin Story is one designer who does some amazing cabled sweaters like Fergus in the recent Rowan issue 56. Um, so if you are interested in seeing some really gorgeous men's patterns, do come take a look at this thread. There are some great recommendations in here, including some that I hadn't come across before. Uh, Martin Story is a great recommendation. And yeah, the recent Rowan issue has some really, really beautiful men's sweaters in it. Uh, so congratulations, Sheila. If you will send me a, a PM, I'm Dark Matter Knits on Ravelry, and I will just, you know, send me your full name and your address, and I will get this to you. And thanks again to Mountain Colors for sharing an extra skein so that I could do the giveaway. I really appreciate it. Okay, so now, moving on, um, I want to talk to about Arkansas Fiber Arts Extravaganza which is a show that's held every year in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is a gorgeous town, about which more in a moment, if I remember. And uh, it used to be held in December, but it has been recently, just this past year, moved to September, which ends up being a much uh, better time to, to go. December last year, the show had an unbelievable ice storm. And... Uh, yeah, it just, it kind of paralyzed the whole show. There were 
I think something like half the people couldn't en ended up not being able to come, maybe even more than that, because of the ice storm. It was really unfortunate. Um, so the show this year is in September, and it will be next year as well. And it's uh, it's a really fun show. It's one of those shows that has uh, slowly grown and has kept its warm character. And I've I've come to befriend the the person who has become the main organizer, Tish. And uh, she's Tishnitz33, I think, on Ravelry. And she um, she told me that, you know, they're a kind of a consistent core of a couple hundred people that come every year. And it really has that feel, you know, the people recognize each other and are very welcoming and are very loyal to each other. It's just, it's a really good group and a lot of the same vendors year after year. Um, it's not a very big show, you know, it's probably several hundred people and then, you know, the people who just come for the market on top of that. Uh, but it has a, you know, a really warm feeling because of that. You know, you're not, you're not in a, a giant market with thousands of people, which, you know, has its benefits and disadvantages, right? So, um, it's about an eight, eight hour drive from me. And so I, uh, have recently been doing some work with Stacy Dawson of Mustache Podcast and Yarns. And so, and she lives just a, an hour and a half south of me. So I'm kind of on her way to the show and I knew she was going to be vending there. So I asked her if she wanted to travel together and she said, sure, which was great because, oh, I can't tell you how much I hate driving to that show by myself. <laughs> I'm such a weenie about long car trips. I hate them. I just don't enjoy driving really at all. Well, I don't mind driving, but I just, I hate driving by myself. It's so boring. And I hate long car trips. So, uh, but you know, I also didn't know Stacy all that well yet. Hadn't really spent that much time with her in person. So, you know, I know we were kind of both thinking, how's this going to work being in the car with each other for 18 hours total? <laughs> and it ended up being great. In fact, I don't think either of us knit at all on either way because we just sort of got so engaged in our conversation with each other that I don't know just didn't feel the need so uh yeah the, tr the travel was really really fun and it was great to get to know Stacy better uh and she she had her van you know full of all of her gorgeous yarn and uh and other stuff that she was bringing for the market and it was her second time vending at a market. She had been to SSK and that was the first time she had vended. And this was her first, you know, sort of bigger show. And uh, so I helped her set up her booth. Not that I'm an expert in setting up booths or anything, but uh, I just thought she could probably use an extra pair of hands. And, uh, and that was really fun, you know, just kind of thinking about where are we going to put this and where's that going to go and what would make this what would be the, you know, the optimal way to organize everything so that people could see the stuff that they liked and understand what they were looking at and see all the samples. And so that was really fun. And I taught 10 hours of classes. So basically I was either teaching or I was helping her out in her booth because when you're working a booth solo, it can be really exhausting and, and also just logistically kind of improbable because when are you going to eat lunch and when are you going to go to the bathroom and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, when are you going to shop for your own yarn if you wanted to get some? So I would try to check back in with her whenever I could and kind of help out with her booth. And she did great. Uh, she had a great show and the best part, <laughs> this was so satisfying and I was there for it, which is even more satisfying. The keynote speaker at, the extravaganza was Stephanie Pearl McPhee. Perhaps you have heard of her, the yarn harlot. And uh, she came to the booth and just went bananas. I mean, she bought four skeins of yarn and immediately wanted to cast on with one of the skeins. It was a, a self-striping sock yarn that Stacy does. And the colorway is called Dark Side of the Moon. And it's based on the Pink Floyd cover. So it has most, it's mostly black and silver stripes with these, with this really cool rainbow stripe. It's just like a few stitches of red, a few stitches of orange, etc. So, uh, 
yeah, it was pretty much all we could do to just keep from going <coughs> while she was in the booth. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, I'm just going to toot my own horn here. I know she dyed the yarn, but I'm the one who made her buy it. <laughs> She's kind of looking around and she had heard of Sesame, which is Sesame Street, which is a another self-striping yarn that Stacy does, which has 16 different colors of stripe in it. And, uh, and she's picking up that and I'm like, well, do you want to see my favorite? And I showed her the dark side of the moon one. And she was like, and I explained how it worked and she just, her eyes just went like this and she grabbed it out of my hands and then cursed me. <laughs> Not literally, of course, but in that way that she does. So, uh, yeah, it was just, it was really fun to see, to be able to, to be there to witness that moment when somebody gets harleted, as we call it in the industry. And sure enough, she has blogged about knitting Stacy's yarn a couple of times since then. And uh, I imagine the dye pots are going like Mach 2 right now, a little further south from me. So that was really cool. Uh, and we also got to have dinner with her, with Stephanie, which was really fun. And um, yeah, it's just, a, it's a really, it's a really nice event. And Hot Springs, hey, I remembered, Hot Springs is a gorgeous town. It's kind of, you can definitely tell it's had its heyday and it was a while ago, but uh, it's just got incredible charm. Um, it's, it was, as the name suggests, it's got Hot Springs running running through it and they they actually bubble up to the surface you can see steam coming out of vents all over town and they are hot the water is hot there are these bathhouses all over town that have date from i think the end of the 19th century and they're just so charming i mean they look just like those turn well they are those turn of the century spa retreat type things they line the whole main street and some of them are still functioning bathhouses where you can go and you know take a restorative dip in the hot spring water and get a massage and mm, nice i have never had the time to do it yet but i will one of these days uh so hot springs is lovely it's a nice sort of artsy town um i defy you to find a place that is open for breakfast before eight in the morning on a weekday <laughs> besides subway but that's a small complaint let me show you what I got, because I did get a few things. Just a couple. It really is just a couple. I um, discovered a new, she is new actually, not just new to me, but fairly new dyer called October House Fiber Arts. And oh my goodness, people, you have got to check her out, especially if you are a warm color, fall color fan, dude. This <laughs> stuff is gorgeous. She has a beautiful palette, gorgeous fiber and yarns. Just a really great eye and a great hand. So this is, oh yeah, that's what it looks like. This fiber is a 60% uh, superwash merino, 30% bamboo, and 10% nylon. It's called Ban Panda SW for superwash. And it's just... Well, I don't have to tell you because you can see it is just beautiful. I probably drooled on several spots on this. And the colorway here is called Cinnamon Girl. This is about four and a half ounces. So it'll make a really nice, um, you, you'll, I'll should be able to get about 400 yards out of this, if not more. So I am really excited about knitting up this, this braid, knitting up, spinning. Can you tell I haven't spun in a while? Spinning this braid of fiber. So that was my one purchase. And then um, to thank me for, well, actually here, let me show you this other thing. This was part of the, this was basically a sort of goodie bag that came with registration. I got these, or everybody got one of these cute little batlings. And this is also Panda. So I think this has... I think this is probably merino and bamboo as well. It's not quite as, that's better. It's not quite as bright as it was showing up there for a minute. Um, so this is from Skyloom Weavers, which is who are based in Cat Spring, Texas. And uh, they also had beautiful stuff. I uh, love this mixture of greens, so gorgeous. I love the way that it's got some bronze in there and some 
um, you know, kind of sea foam bits and more fluorescent bits and even some little bits of, uh, that might just be an artifact. Yes, it is. I was going to say there's some orange in there too, but that was just fuzz from something else. That was very nice to have a little surprise in there. And um, and then Stacy gave me some yarn to thank me for helping her with her booth, which was very sweet. Uh, so this is the sesame that I was talking about. Right? Wow, I just channeled Heather Ord over there for a minute. <laughs> uh, this is called, this is Perfect Sock Self Striping. 16 different colors, people. And uh, they're each, each one represents a different part of Sesame Street, which is just adorable. I think the stripes are supposed to knit up about two or three rounds wide. And it's enough for a, a good sized pair of socks. So I love this. In fact, though, what I'm thinking about doing this, doing with this is making um, these like long cuffs on a, on a sweater, like picking out a one of these solid colors as the rest of the sweater, and then do this as uh, as long cuffs, and maybe some trim on around the edges. And then I also got this, which is a sport weight, and this colorway, well, the base is called Sport Sock from Mustache Yarns, and the colorway is Retro Rainbow number six. I think the number refers to how many stripes there are, so there are six colors in this, and I love I love how sherbety it is. It is also this bright. So, so gorgeous. I really appreciate her doing that. Um, oh, and I also wanted to show you, I picked this up from October House too, and I'll show you their, their card as well. This woman has such, such a great design sensibility in all senses. She does her own little uh, cards and tags too. And she painted that little acorn. I think it's so sweet. So that's her. She's October, October house shop at gmail.com. And her shop is on Etsy, Octoberhouse.etsy.com. And then this is, these are these cute little um, hand spun tags where, it, you know, basically you can write down you know, what's in the fiber, how long, how many yards it is, wraps per inch, and that kind of stuff. And then it comes with little ties to attach it to your, to your, to your finished skein of yarn. Super sweet. So yeah, I was very excited about finding them. And I hope you will go visit those two shops because they've just got beautiful stuff. Um, the teaching went really well. You may remember from a previous episode that I felt a little scathed after my previous teaching experience. And, uh, and I just, I had no problems this time. Um, in fact, I, you know, the organizers were telling me repeatedly how much people were raving about my classes. So honestly, I'm a bit baffled as to how, how, you know, that I could have such extremes of, but I, th I think some of it has to do with the different nature of the shows. One is a big city show and one is not. Um, so the expectations are a little different. Uh, and, and honestly, I think I was a little bit better prepared this time. I, there, I taught a couple of classes at DFW that I had never taught before. And I don't think I will ever do that again at a big show. I think I will first teach them at my local yarn store or, or at a smaller show before trying it at a bigger show because there's just these things. If you've ever taught knitting before, you know that it's really hard to anticipate how long things are going to take and what kinds of issues people are going to bring up. And there's no substitute for just having taught it once or twice before to be able to anticipate some of those things. Things that I think will take a while to get through sometimes just go by in 10 minutes and stuff that sometimes I think, oh, this will be easy. They'll get this no problem. Sometimes it takes us an hour. So, you know, it can be really unpredictable. Okay, so that is Arkansas Fiber Arts Extravaganza. I will definitely be going back again next year, and I hope I will get to th see you there sometime. In fact, I had a couple... <laughs> so I'm still not... I'm not used to having podcast fan moments, but I actually, I, I love when people come up to me and they say, are you dark matter knits? <laughs> okay. 
Yeah? Who are you? <laughs> Hi. It's really nice. So, uh, yeah, that was really fun. Last thing before we get to the technique segment, I want to talk about, because this last thing kind of ties in with the technique segment, I want to talk about this uh, sort of odd lanyard that happened to me last, uh, well, actually it was a few weeks ago now, last month. Uh, a friend of mine contacted me. She's a friend of mine through, uh, she's she's also a history history person. And uh, she said that a mutual, or that a friend of hers in her neighborhood was leaving town, leaving Austin, and uh, that his yarn business had closed down and he just, he really just wanted to get rid of everything. He just wanted to give it all away. Uh, you know, he's moving at the end of the week. If I could just come over sometime before the end of the week, he was just going to give me a whole bunch of yarn. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I will not take your yarn. No. <laughs> so here's the story. Uh, it was this company, and you may have, you may remember this, um, company called Yarn Harvest that was based here, and uh, it was yarnharvest.com, and actually that, don't even bother going to the website now because it's been taken down, uh, but they basically, they're, basically what they did was they got uh, remnants, clothing remnants, unraveled them, and then reskained the yarn to sell as basically recycled yarn. And um, and they were just starting to get into working with the Texas Fiber Mill to use, uh, you know, basically wool remnants from the Fiber Mill to spin up some cashmere yarn. And then the Texas Fiber Mill folded, and then Yarn Harvest folded, and, you know, now this guy has all this yarn on his hands and he's moving to Savannah, and he just needed to get rid of it. And there I was. <laughs> so I go over to his house with my son, and I'm like, I don't even know. Like, I haven't figured out a good way to ask, a polite way to ask, how much yarn are we talking about exactly? Like, do I have a big enough car? And it turns out it was fine. It was, it was still a lot of yarn, but it was... Uh, it was about two very large garbage bags full of this stuff. And uh, and I spent an afternoon sorting through everything. And basically what I found was it's largely, probably about half of it is fingering weight. And the rest is some lace weight, sport, DK, kind of up to Aaron. And um, it's this interesting, it feels very much like what you would expect a vintage sweater or a commercial wool sweater to feel like if you unraveled it and reskained it into yarn. It is not the softest yarn in the world. It is, it's wool, right? This is great stuff to felt with. This is great stuff for outerwear. It, um, it's not scratchy, not at all. It's just not super soft. It's not merino. I could wear this around my neck. I'm gonna, you can't stop me. I know I look like a dork. Yeah, it's not bothering me at all. Um, this is some of the softer stuff, but still. So this is a fingering weight. And there's just tons of it. I mean, I've got bins and bins of this stuff. So I will be finding some way to, to give some of it away for sure. Uh, I have plans to do some Fair Isle sweaters with the, with the large amount of fingering weight that I've got. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring this up to talk about this is that check out what's going on up here at the top. This isn't necessarily the best example of what's going on here, but do you see how it's a little kinked up there? And there are some of the skeins in this, in the yarn harvest bins that uh, are really quite kinked up still. And I don't know exactly what their process was for reskeining, cleaning and reskeining the yarn. It's clearly been cleaned. Um, I don't know what they did to take the kinks out of it though. So here's what I'm talking about. And this kind of is leading over into the technique segment. When you knit up wool yarn, especially, 
uh, any yarn that has memory in it, that you know kind of wants to stay in the position that you've put it in. It's a nice thing about wool yarn, right? Is that you you put it in a position and it stays. Go in the corner wool, the wool will stay. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really stretch out that much. At least you know the regular wool, not the superwash. It just stays in its current shape. It's very obedient and. Um, the thing is that if it's if you've left it, if you've you know knit up something and it's been in that state for a little while, even as as little as a few days, it wants to stay in that shape. So you'll get that little kinky look from you know it ha it's having been stretched into those knitted stitch shapes. So how do you go about getting it back into you know just a straight flat shape again? So here's what you do, and I don't know if they tried to do this and just didn't weight it down enough or what, but the best advice that I can give you is once you frog something, the first step that you've got, I mean, you've got this, well, let's say you're starting with a thing you need to frog. One thing that would be very handy to have would be a yarn swift. You know, those umbrella swifts, the kind that open out. If you don't have one, you've seen it at yarn shops, they open up like an umbrella and you, know, you can put a skein on them and wind a ball off of them. These are very handy for frogging too and reskeining because you can do it in reverse, right? Basically what I do is I take the end and I just tie it onto one of the little holes on the swift. And then while I'm frogging, I'd literally just spin the swift around with my hand. If you have an electric one, you can just turn it on and it will pull the yarn off It'll basically frog, you know, the sweater or the hat or whatever for you. So then you've got you've got it all skeined up again, right? You've got it in a in a big circle. But you'll notice as soon as you take it off the swift that it's all kinked up. So basically, then you want to tie it up in the same way that it the same sort of way that it was when you bought it at the yarn shop. You know how they get those little ties, and um, you basically just get some some scrap yarn. And in at least two places, I would suggest, run it um, in between the plies of the yarn. Do this while it's still on the swift. In between the plies of the yarn and back up again and tie it. And do that again where the ends, do it in the places where the ends are so that you can tie it to the end so it doesn't, you know, come undone. Tie the little piece of scrap yarn to the end and around itself so that it's just kind of holding the yarn in that shape. And then you want to soak it in some water. Room temperature to somewhat warm water would be a good idea. Let it sit for at least 15 minutes. You may you may even want to wash it if the thing that was knitted has been handled or worn or you know it's gotten dusty or whatever. Um, pull it out of the water. Actually, you know, kind of pull pick it all up in one wad. Uh, squeeze, gently squeeze the excess water out of it, put it on a towel, roll it up, stomp, or squish all the water out of it. And then what I do is I either get a sweater rack out and lay it over, lay, lay it over one of the, um, you know, the little rack pieces, but not flat. You actually want to hang it and you even want to put some weight on it. So not too much, but maybe a couple of clothes pins on each end. So you've got it hanging down like this, a couple of clothes pins here, a couple here, just to kind of pull some of those kinks out. So the basically getting it wet plus that weight and the drying should do the trick. Um, you, the more springy the yarn is, the more you may need to weight it down just because that springiness will make it want to kind of contract. So, uh, so yeah, that's how you get it back. And then you can re-ball it up again. So put it back on the Swift once it's dry and, uh, you know, and ball it up again and it's ready to knit. So it's a process. And honestly, you can knit kinked yarn. There is nothing particularly wrong with that. It can mess with your gauge a little bit though, just because, and some people find it really annoying. They just don't like having it be all kinky like that. But if you've ever knit from a sock blank, which is where it's a machine knitted piece and you just 
unravel to make a sock as you knit. Uh, you're knitting with kink yarn there too. So it's it's you know your discretion whether you want to go about worrying about that or not. But I think if you're going to be selling it, you probably should have been doing that. Maybe he was, but it, it, it in some cases it was more successful than others, I suppose. Can you believe I'm complaining about somebody who gave me two giant garbage bags of yarn? The gratitude, I tell you. It is lacking in this one. Did I get close enough there? <laughs> okay. I think that's probably enough for today, don't you? I will be back in two weeks. Really, two weeks this time. And until then, you can find me online as Dark Matter Knits everywhere. Ravelry, Instagram are the two places that I most often frequent. There's a Dark Matter Knits group there. Uh, but you can also find me on Facebook and on Twitter and on Pinterest. And my website is darkmatternits.com. All right, I'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye. Gotta find my mouse. It's buried underneath all my stuff. Bye.